Galatians 4, we read from verse number 1. The Bible tells us that it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardian and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has set forth his spirit, uh, set forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, therefore, you are no longer slaves, but sons. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then, indeed, when you did not know God, when you served those things, those which are by nature not God, but now, after you have been, after you have known God, or rather, are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you were, to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons. May the Lord bless the reading of his words in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this verse of scripture, we're going to go one by one before we go and zero in on the verse that we'll be looking at this very evening. In verse 1 to 3, Paul the Apostle wrote, he said, now I say, the, now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, as long as his child does not differ from all, from uh, differ at all from his slave, though he is a master of all, but is under guardian and steward until the time appointed by the father. Even so we, when we're children, we're in bondage under the elements of this world. Here, Paul is comparing the believer who has, has, you know, comparing believers to someone who has come into an inheritance. He's saying that the believer is the heir to the promise of God. You are, a, you are heir to the promise of God that was given through Abraham. But he's saying that as long as the believer, who is the heir, is under age, is still a baby. He said that particular heir may, does not have the full right or does not have the full access to that particular promise. The reason is because he lacks the capacity for self-determination. He has the cap lacks the capacity to be able to self-administer himself. Okay? He said that there is still something else that controls that particular individual because they are underage, because they are minor. They, are, they lack the power for self-determination. They lack the power for self-control. As such, something else is controlling them. And now gives an example. You know, for us to understand what Paul is saying, take an example. A rich man dies, has a large estate, but he has a son who is a minor. But that, but that, but that son is the one that inherits all the property of that particular rich man. What Paul is trying to say is that as soon as the, though the son owns all of the father's property, the son will not be able to access that property, will not be able to possess that property and utilize it for his own advantage until that child comes of age. Until that child becomes an adult. And as long as that child remains a minor, he will be under guardianship, he will understand what other people will be controlling and directing what he's doing. That's what Paul is saying. So Paul here is arguing that our condition before Christ is like a child that has a large inheritance but has not developed the capacity to be able to control or manage his own life. Because before we came to Christ, we were ruled by sin. Okay, We were ruled by sin and we were directed by sin. Our lives were controlled by the law. Okay, And Paul is now saying that we do not have the access to the fullness of the promise of Abraham because we are still under control of something else. We are not yet emancipated by the blood of the Lamb. So in other words, as long as we are, as long as we remain in that state of sin, under the control of the law, we will not be able to access the blessings that God has made available to us through Abraham. We are all under the guardianship of the law. And what changed that was when Christ showed up. In verse number that's, and that's what verse number four tells us. Verse number seven, four said, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, under the law. Here Paul is saying, the fullness of time came when Paul, when God himself decided to present Jesus Christ to the world as he has promised. Paul is saying, and we, we remain under guardianship, we remain under stewardship, we remain under the control of the law until Jesus Christ showed up. Which means that when Christ came, Christ came, Christ coming was not an accident. It was planned by the Almighty God. It was the same. It was the time that you know it was what the Lord has been speaking to the patriarchs and the and the and the prophet before time. And when the right time came, 
Jesus Christ showed up. And that's what you see in the book of Mark chapter 1. If you read from verse number 14, the Bible says, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, which means the time is now. I did not come in here by accident, the time is now. And the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. In other words, the right time, the, the right time that God determined, Jesus Christ showed up. And the reason, you know, and when he showed up, he showed up like a human being. He showed up like a human being, born of a woman, born under the law. The intention is so that he can fulfill the law, pay the price of the law so that he can deliver us and make us who we're supposed to be. But verse number 5 now told us, don't take my word for it, but verse number 5 now told us the reason why Jesus Christ came in the fullness of time. If you read verse number 5, it says, to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. In other words, there are two basic reasons, according to this verse of the scripture, why Jesus Christ came in the fullness of time. The first reading is to redeem those of us who are under the law. To redeem means to buy back. Jesus Christ had to pay the price of sin. He had to pay the price of sin so that you know, to be able to bring us out of the bondage of sin. Okay? The Bible tells us, if you read the book of John chapter 1, Gospel of John chapter 1, in verse number 12 there, it says, but as many as received him, he gave them the power to become the, he gave them the right to become the, to become the children of God, those who are, be, who believe in his name. So Jesus Christ came, the first reason why he came was number one, so that he can buy, you know, he can redeem us who are under the law, and then number two, to adopt us who believe into the family of God. So it's wanting to take us out of that particular bondage where we are and then graft us into the family of the Almighty God. Those are the twofold reasons why Jesus Christ came. And Jesus, and the Bible tells us in John that I just read, it said that as many as believe, as many as receive him, as many have accepted that particular sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, the Bible is saying that you have now been given the power to be called the Son of God. Which means you now take, you have now been grafted into that family. You have now been adopted into that particular family. And because of that adoption, because of that adoption that took place as a result of what Jesus Christ had done on the cross, look at verse number six and seven, what the Bible says. The Bible says, because you are now sons. Okay? Because you are his son, God sent his spirit. God sent the spirit of his son into your heart. The spirit which calls out, Abba Father. So you are no longer slave. But God's child, since you are his child, he has made you also an heir. In other words, Paul, uh, uh, Paul is writing to the believers, he's saying that before, you had no access to this particular treasure. You had no access to God. You were alien. You were separated from the Almighty God. But now Jesus Christ died. And the reason he died was to buy you out of bondage, bring you into his family. He said, now that you are in his family, he put his own spirit inside of you. And that spirit can relate to you, can relate to God as father. And so therefore, because of the spirit of God that now dwells inside of you, you are no longer slaves. You are no longer alienated from the almighty God. You are no longer separate. You can walk into his presence and call upon his name. You can ask whatever you want. You don't need any more intermediary because Jesus Christ has made the way open. You remember the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew. It said that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, it said the veil that was separating the holies of holies of the old temple was torn into two, thereby giving everybody access. As many as who believe in the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have been translated in and the Spirit of God has been deposited in us and now we are sons and daughters of the Almighty God. We are no longer slaves. And that's what Paul is saying. And because we are no longer slaves, because we are now sons of God, the Bible is now talking about the dignity of the believer. And that dignity of the believer it means that you now have an inheritance in Christ. Not just an inheritance in Christ, you now have access to what he had promised unto Abraham. Okay? The Bible is now saying that we are no longer slaves, but now we are daughters, and we are now, you know, we are no longer the guardianship, but we are now, you know, we now have access to the promise of God. And this is possible because God has put his spirit inside of you. See, all those who are born again have that spirit of God that he has given unto them. In the book of, I think, Second Corinthians 5 5 was talking about the fact that he put his spirit upon us as a seal, as a guarantee that you belong unto him. Now, because God has adopted us into his family, Paul is now saying, Paul is now trying to draw a distinction. He's now saying that now that you are in his family, now that you have a spirit, now that you have access to the promise of Abraham, he's now trying to draw a distinction. And that distinction is what he drew in verse number 8 and verse number 9, when he said, Formerly, when you did not know God, that is before you were born again, 
Before you were adopted into his family, before you received the spirit, before you had access to the promise of Abraham, he said, formerly when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. In other words, you were serving beggarly elements. As I described them as, as idols who have eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear. They have hands, but they cannot lift up anything. They have to be carried up and down. And Paul is saying, before you came to God, these were the kind of things that you were serving and you were calling gods. But now that you know God, or rather, now that God has directly invited you unto himself and you are known by him, he said, how is it then that you are turning back to the weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? In other words, making a distinction. Now, God has given you freedom. God has given you liberty. He has given you access to the riches of heaven. And you look at all those things. And then you turn your back and say, this is what you want. Paul is now wondering, what is wrong with these kind of people? Okay? He's basically saying, you this Galatian, have you forgotten before before? Before before when you were still living in your sin? Have you forgotten the kind of life that you were living? You were living a life that was under bondage. You were living a life that you are bowing down to false gods. God came and delivered you. Now, after you have been delivered from those particular gods and all those particular bondage, but now you want to, you know, God, is, you are now serving the true God. You now have a knowledge of the true God. You now have an understanding of who God is. Paul is now saying, what in the world will want to make you go back into where God has taken you from? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Why would you want to go back into bondage after you have been freed? Why would you want to go back into why would you want to go back into slavery after you have received deliverance? Why would you want to begin to go into the place where you have been oppressed when the Lord has given you freedom? Why? And that is the question that we are exploring this evening. Why would an individual want to go back into slavery? Why would they want to go back into bondage? Why would they not enjoy the freedom that is found in Christ? I want you to understand one thing. Since the beginning of this particular study, Paul has been doing some comparison all throughout. He has been comparing the life under the law and life under the promise of God. He has been talking about living under the law and living under the you know, under the bondage uh, under the under the promise that has been was made unto Abraham. He's talking about the life in Christ and the life outside of Christ. The question is for those who are just if you if you look at all this uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the 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 questions that Paul has been asking and how he has been comparing these two things, it appears that he was he has a fixation. He has a fixation on drawing a distinction between life in Christ and life outside of Christ. And the question is, why would you, why was Paul so fixated on the fact that people need to understand the difference between living in the life of Christ and living outside of Christ? Why was he so fixated on this thing? Let me give you an idea. Let me suggest to you that Paul was fixated on this distinction because he understood that there is a benefit in the new life. There's a benefit of our new life. There's a benefit when you come into the Lord Jesus Christ. When you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul understood that there is a benefit to living in Christ and he wanted the church to be aware of it. It is not just enough to say, I believe in God. I said the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying that when you do that, there's a lot of benefit that is associated with that decision. When you are translated into the kingdom of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, he said that there's a lot of benefit and he wanted the church to be aware of it. That's why he was fixated in you understanding the difference between living for Christ and living outside of Christ. That's the first reason. The second reason is that Paul understood that there are some privileges that come with that particular association with the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows they will have a special right. He knows we have advantages. He knows we have immunity. He knows we have access. We have a lot of benefit, a lot of privilege that comes with being in Christ Jesus. And the unfortunate thing is that a lot of believers, even in the day, even in the time of the Galatian church, were not aware of this. And that was why Paul was so fixated on making that distinction so that the people can know exactly what they have, what their privilege is when they accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, Paul also was so fixated on this because he knew the dignity that is associated with the children of God. He knew the dignity that is associated with being in Christ. Paul understood that the angels are jealous of men and they are jealous of the men that are fallen, talkless of men who have not been redeemed. 
He knew there was a dignity that is associated with being a child of God. He knew the respect and the envy that comes, even in the kingdom of darkness. How much power that has been given to the children of God. He knew all those things were there. The dignity that comes with being called a child of God. And unfortunately, Paul also realized that the church did not understand. And that was why he was so fixated on this whole thing. That was why he was trying to make sure that they do not forget, that they do not miss that blessing, that they do not, under, that they do not give up this thing. And that was why he was confused. That was why he was asking the question, why would you want to give up your blessings? Why would you want to give up your privilege? Why would you want to give up the dignity of being a child of God? Why would you want to do that and go back into bondage, go back into slavery, go back into observing the law, go back into living a life of, you know, you know in submission, submitting to beggarly elements that call themselves God? He said, why would you do that? Paul was having a difficult time understanding why anyone will do that and why anyone will be will, will, you know, will, 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 will give up the freedom and the benefits of Christ and go into slavery. Christ he, he was just he was just he was just perplexed. And the question is, the question now is that now, now, the question of is that, is that is it Paul, you know, this question of Paul the Apostle kind of raised another question that has been debated in the church for a long time. There are many who believe that a child of God, as soon as you are born again, you can never backslide. You can never, you know, you know, once you are saved, you are always saved forever. And there are those who also believe that a believer can fall if he lives a careless life. Okay? This has been an ongoing debate. And this is one of the questions. This is an implication of one of the questions that Paul is asking. If you have been born again, why would you want to go back into slavery? Which means when you are born again, there's a possibility of you sliding back. The question is, is, you know, is it when a believer is born again, will he ever remain like that? Or do you have, is there a possibility of them backsliding? Unfortunately, this is not the Bible story for me to discuss it. I don't want to go into I don't want to go into that particular debate. Because it's not the subject of this particular of this particular uh, subject of Bible study, you know, it will be a subject for another day. But here's what I will say: It is important for believers to understand the difference between loss of fellowship after salvation and loss of salvation after salvation. Okay, and this is not just a, a an attempt to play on words. I'm just trying to make a distinction. There's a difference between loss of fellowship and apostasy. Two different things. One thing for every believer must understand is that we all as believers, at one point in time, we make mistakes. We fall into sins. Some of us are besetting sins. Some of them are, you know, we all have our own unique besetting sins and we fall when we are not careful. Okay? This is normal. This is what happened, you know, this happens to believers. Okay? And the Lord Almighty already made provision for that. 1 John chapter 1 verse 8 tells us, If we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, there is no way you will walk and your head will not shake. That's, way, that's basically what we're saying. People make mistakes. Even the patriarchs in the scripture, those who walk and eat with the Lord Jesus Christ, made mistakes. Peter denied Christ. So it tells you that there is possibility for us to make mistakes. I am convinced that when a believer falls into sin, what happens to that believer is a loss of fellowship. Because at that point in time, there's a conviction for sin. And that's when you lose your peace. That's when you lose your joy. And if you continue in that state, the Spirit of God, if you are a true child of God, the, child, the Spirit of God will convict you that you are outside of fellowship. At that point in time, prayer becomes difficult. Reading the word of God becomes very difficult. Fellowship with other saints becomes very difficult. Why? Because you have broken fellowship. Sin has broken fellowship. Your eyes of the Almighty God is no longer in fellowship with you. And that's one of the things the Bible says that when Jesus was on the cross bearing the sins of the world, the Bible said the eyes of the Almighty God was turned away. And that's why he said, My Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? In other words, when sin comes in, the eyes of the Almighty God departs. Fellowship is broken. Okay, so I believe, so I'm, I, I am convinced that when a believer falls in sin, fellowship with God is broken. And that is one, but that is not to say that when a believer lives in active sin, when a believer lives in active, continuous sin, and there is no conviction, there is no remorse, that person is still able to pray and do well, you should check that person very well. There's a strong probability that they were not actually born again in the first place. Because the Bible says that when they are born again, the Spirit of God is in them. And that Spirit assures that they are sons and daughters of God. 
Now, if a son and a daughter of God offends his father and is not remorseful and doesn't feel any kind of uh, it doesn't feel any kind of pain, any kind of sorrow, any kind of uneasiness, and is comfortable in that sin, there's a problem. There is a problem. If a professing believer continues in active sin to the point of denying Christ and remaining in that state till death, such a person was not born again in the first place. That is my position. And that's my way. Because the Bible tells us in the book of 1 John chapter 2 verse 9. 19, sorry. 1 John chapter 2 verse 19. He said, they went out from, from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been with us, been of us, they would not doubt, they would, not, they would have no, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they may be made, that they may be made manifest that they were not of us. In other words, they were pretending to be believers. A believer is not just somebody who professes it. It's a believer is somebody who has encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is describing people who profess to be Christians, but in actual reality have not encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's possible for somebody to profess it and then walk away. And I say that because the Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 29. The Bible tells us that for whom he did foreknow, he also did he, did he predestinate. To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called him who, uh, and whom he called, then he also justified, and whom he justified, then he also glorified. Which simply means that when you have true saving faith, when you have been encounter, when you have encountered the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord will keep you to the very end. The Lord will preserve you. To the very end. Many of you have heard me joke about it. That he that is in Christ is a new creation. All things have passed away and all things have become new. Which means that if you are in Christ. Or you claim to be in Christ. And all things have not passed away. And all have not become new. Two possibilities. Either you met, you did not meet Jesus. Or you met the wrong one. Because if you met the right one. Something will change. It doesn't mean that you become perfect overnight. It simply means that when everything goes wrong. Something inside of your spirit tells you. Something has gone wrong. Okay? So having said that, what is the reason why people go back into bondage after professing Christ? Why do they backslide? Let me suggest to you that most people backslide in the first place because they were not saved in the first place. The church is a place where people have learned the language, they learn the mannerism, they learn the culture. We are a place where we foster a lot of hypocrites, people who know how to speak the Christian language. And as a result, we assume that everybody who speaks the language is one of us, is, is one in the church, is, you know, has encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. But when life begins to happen to that individual, we now begin to see that all sorts of things happen. They probably, you know, most people, you know, those who go back after professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the first indication is that they were not born again in the first place. Number two, why do people backslide? People backslide because they also can believe a lie. Because they believe a lie. The Bible tells us in the book of Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. After Paul preached to the, to the Galatian church, they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. They started walking with him. All of a sudden, some Judaizers came from Jerusalem and started preaching something else. And they believed. And in Galatians chapter 3 verse 1, Paul the apostle confronted them and said, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that ye would not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. In other words, you saw the evidence that Jesus Christ is Lord. You saw the manifestation of Jesus in your life. How come you have not believed the life that you started in the spirit you want to end up in the flesh? In other words, you encountered the power of God, but now you have been believed, you have believed a lie. You have been, you have been talked into the position of getting out of the faith that you believe. So it is possible that people who believe can end up believing a lie and then end up walking away from the gospel. Number three, people backslide because they love and want the acceptance of the world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 tells us, Love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In other words, when you want the accolades of the world, when you want to achieve what the world is achieving, when you want to be pleasing to the world, there is a strong probability that you may not last in the kingdom. 
As long as the love of the world is in the heart of an individual, walking with God becomes very, very difficult. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, it talks about the man called Demas. He said, for Demas has forsaken me. Why did he forsake Paul the apostle? Because he loved this present world and has departed into Thessalonica. So Paul is talking to, the, talking to Timothy about the man called Demas, who loved the world and as a result departed from the gospel. Another reason why people depart from the gospel is because of the hardship and difficulty of life. The hardship and difficulty of life, the hardship and the difficulty of the gospel, the demand of the gospel. The Bible tells us in the book of John chapter 6 verse 60, he said, many, when Jesus Christ was preaching at one point, he said, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard his, when they heard his preaching, when they heard the demand of the gospel, when they heard the demand of life that the gospel will place upon them, they said, they said this, uh, they, they, when they heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can bear it? And then in verse number 66, the Bible says, from that time on, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. People go back to the world when the demand of life becomes too hard. When the demand of the gospel they refuse to pay. When life begins to happen and they find it very difficult to manage, they begin to, you know, they go back into the world when those challenges begin to happen. And then finally, people, re, you know, go back into the world when they refuse to grow and, you know, when they refuse to grow in the light of the word of God. Galatians chapter 4, reading from verse number 1, tells us, Now I say, that the heir, as long as a child does not differ at all from a slave, though he is a master of all, but is under guardian and stewardship until the time appointed by the father. Even so, when we were children, we were bondage under the element of this world. In other words, as long as we refuse to grow, we will continue to be controlled by the elements of this world. As long as we refuse to grow, we will not be different from the unbeliever because you will not see the power of the gospel manifested in your life. When you don't see the power of the gospel manifested in your life, there's a strong tendency to begin to believe that the word of God is not true. And when you believe that the word of God is not true, you begin to look for alternative. People go back when they refuse to grow, when they refuse to, when they refuse to exercise their faith in the things of God. So these are some of the reasons. Uh, and the question is, what is the danger? Of going back. Look at Galatians chapter 4 verse 9. Galatians chapter 4 verse 9 and 10. He said, but now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. In other words, the danger of going back is that you return to the things that you are forsaken. You have said that you are not going to lie anymore. You are not going to live in a particular way anymore. But when you begin to backslide, you see that those things begin to creep back into your life. The danger number two is that you begin to live under the bondage that you have been delivered from. When you begin to see that you are beginning to welcome those things that you have rejected. You are beginning to hang out with the people that you are forsaken. You are beginning to go to places that you promised yourself you are not going to go to. When you begin to do the things that you vowed you will not do again. You find out that you are beginning to go back. Number three, how do you go back? What are the dangers of going back? The dangers of going back is that you begin to deny the things that you profess. That is when you begin to make joke of what the Bible is teaching. You begin to make joke of secret things, sacred things. You begin to make joke of the word of God. When you begin, when you begin to see that, you are in danger of backsliding already. What are the dangers of going back? The dangers of going back is that you invalidate your profession and endanger the faith of other people. Because other people are watching you. You probably have sang in the choir. You probably have ministered to other people. And now you are the same person coming back and telling them all that I said before is not true. What happens is that you are going to endanger the faith of other people. And to top it off, you now begin to create a stumbling block for other people to come in. If this person was once on fire for God and all of a sudden is no longer serving God, what is that? That means whatever they are saying is not true. You create a stumbling block for other people to come in. And then finally you become a very good target for the enemy to deal with. And the enemy will deal with such an individual because he knows that he will not give you an opportunity to repent and go come into the saving, you know, come into the saving grace. So those are the dangers. The dangers that you return back to the things you forsaken. You begin to you begin to live under the same bondage that the Lord has delivered you from. You begin to deny the things that you have profess. You begin to invalidate your profession and endanger the life of other people. You stand as a stumbling block for other people and then you become a target for the enemy. And what you find is that you become something, you know, your word becomes a, 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 a snare to the word of God. 
Your life becomes a stare to the word of God. And ultimately, you wasted the grace of God upon your life. I pray that will not be our portion in Jesus' name. Yeah. The question then is, how do you keep from, how do you keep yourself? How do you preserve yourself so that you do not, you know, you do not backslide? The Bible says that let him that stands take heed lest he fall. In other words, each and every one of us, we are, we, are, we are susceptible to that if we are not careful. Paul the Apostle said, I think in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I think in verse number 27, he was saying something that he said, I keep my body under. In other words, I check my life. He said, therefore, so that after I have preached to other people, I myself will not be a castaway. In other words, there's a need for us to watch ourselves. So how do you keep yourself from going back? The first thing is that you need to know what you believe. You need to know what you believe. Who did you believe? Why do you believe what you believe? Know what you believe. Then you know what you are saved from. Know what you are saved from. Know what you are saved from because you need to understand the difference between the life that you are living before and the life that you are living now. The problem is that many of the people who in church today, they never came to a conviction of sin. They never understood the danger of what they were doing before when they came, you know, when they claimed to be born again. There was no turning point in their life where they came to realize that if I continue in this direction, it is not a good thing for me. They never came to that. Many of us came to Christ in the popular fashion. Somebody was preaching. You talk about the fact that you are going to be rich. I told you about the benefit of the cross. The benefit, the privilege of the cross. I told you about the, 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 the high standing of the children of God. You love to have those kind of things in your life. And so at the end of this message, I say, would you want to born again? You raise up your hand. You never understood the meaning of sin. You never understand the conviction. The Spirit of God had not done a number on your heart to be able to bring you to the point of submission. And as such, because we don't know that, we don't know what we have left behind, we don't even know what we are coming into because there's no difference between where we are coming from and where we are going. As such, we can crawl. The lines are blurred so we can go back and forth. For us to remain in the faith and not to go back, number one, you must know what you believe. Number two, you must know what you have been saved from. You must know what you have been saved from. Number three, you must know why you believe what you believe. Because if you don't know why you are doing something, there's a strong probability that you are going to abandon it halfway. Why are you in church? Why are you serving the Lord? Why are you calling upon his name? Are you calling upon his name because you are looking for a good girl in, uh, in the church? Or because you want to make money? Or because it is the church that you have some big boys and you can have connection for business? What is the reason why you are serving the Lord? Because it is the reason that will determine how long you are going to walk with him. Number four, you must know how you came to the Almighty God. Did you came to Him? Did you did you walk in? Did you come to faith as a result of somebody cajoling you, or you came to faith as a result of conviction? How did you come? For you to remain, you must know the benefit of what it what it means to be a Christian. You must know the price and the benefit of what it means to be a Christian. The Bible says that he that will live godly will suffer persecution. You must understand that. The Bible tells us, it says, best have no, it says, best have, best have nets, foxes have hope, but the son of man have no place to place his head. In other words, it's telling you that this thing is not a joy ride. And the people who will come unto him, he says, anyone who puts his hands upon the plow must first of all consider the cause. If you put your hands on the plow and you look back, he says, you are not qualified for the kingdom. Those were the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you must know the costs of what you believe. And know the benefit of that cause. Because Jesus Christ, when his disciples were talking to him, he said, Ah, you've asked God, we've left this, we've left this. What is the benefit? He said, those of you who have left houses, left home, left brother, left father, he said, you will receive a hundredfold. He promised them. So they know that what they are paying the price for has a benefit. What do you know the price of your faith? Do you know what it costs you to be a Christian? And do you know the benefit of it? And then finally, you must know the danger of going back. Bible says that anyone who goes back and says, my soul is not with him. In other words, if you decide to follow for a while and you go back, you are going to be one of those people that the enemy will do a number on. Because you have ridiculed him in the open. You have messed him up in the open. Devil is a liar. Yes, devil is a fool. And then eventually you go back again to his camp. If I were the devil, I would slap the daylight out of you. <laughs> Honestly, I will slap the daylight out of you so that you next time you will not run your mouth anyhow. But the point I'm making is that there's a danger. You need to understand the danger. When you understand the danger, it helps to keep you in the narrow way. In closing, I want us to read the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 will be reading from verse number 35. The Bible says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
He says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or perils or sword, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Christ that loved us. For I am persuaded. I am convinced, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present or things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The question for us this evening is that what will separate you from the love of God? Is it the love of this world? Is it the beauty of these things? The, the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. What is it that will take us from the love? From the love? Is it because we want to be accepted? What is it that will take you from the love of God? 